going to jump into the word this morning, but before we do, I know pa- Pastor Evan had mentioned we had uh, went, um, I don't know if she mentioned that we went to the Hogs game. We mentioned that the Hogs won, but we actually went to the Razorback game yesterday, and uh, on the way home, we got to uh, uh, talk with, with the boys, and, and I had three boys, and then uh, my cousin Ben, and I had Danny, and then I had, uh, help me out with this band's name, huh? Anthony. I can't read. Anthony. And uh, so, and then there was only one lady in the car besides my wife. Um, and so we were on the way back, and, and they were like talking about girls, right? You ever been around, got like these high school boys talking about girls, and uh, and they were just like, you know, being at the ball game, there's girls everywhere. And uh, I was t- talking to them about how you know how to find the right girl for your life. You want a girl that you know loves the Lord. And so um, I, I happened to pick up. Um, uh, a few a few pickup lines uh, and shared them with them, um, so this so you know that this is a girl that loves Jesus. So um, this could be for guys or girls. There's a couple of them right here. Uh, so I gave them these pickup lines and they were pretty good. I, so I thought I'd share a couple of them with you this morning. Um, if you're looking for a girl, you might uh, ask her. Um, you, uh, I, I believe one of my ribs belongs to you. Uh, so uh, so last night I was reading in the book of Numbers. And uh, then I realized I didn't have yours. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, hey, I'm Will. God's will for your life. Um, I, I thought this one was pretty good. This one got a, a pretty good laugh. And, uh, and I think it was actually quoted. Um, and it was, it was this. Uh, is it hot in here? Or is that just the Holy Spirit burning on the inside of you? <laughs> Woo! Hey, I was just wondering if you think it's a sin that you stole my heart. And last but not least, this is the ultimate right here. Uh, Girl, is your name Faith? Because you're the substance of the things I've been hoping for. Mm. Girl. Girl. Woo, girl. You are the substance of the things I've been hoping for. No, probably don't use those. Uh, Those are a little cheesy. Um, but kind of funny, nonetheless. So uh, we're in this series called I Am. We're talking about God and his names and how he revealed himself as a covenant, uh, covenant friend, a covenant partner. Um, last week, I'm not going to go through the ones where we've gone because it's just too, there'll be too much review this morning uh, for time's sake. But just last week, we talked about how we have uh, a, the, the God of peace. And, and it was when uh, Gideon uh, saw the Lord and he thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. Because uh, the Bible tells us anyone who has seen the Lord could not live, especially at that time where there was sin. Uh, and, and so he thought he would, when he realized after he said, hey, stay here, he went and, you know, uh, fixed a, a goat or some, or maybe it was a sheep. Um, anyway, goat, sheep, whatever. <laughs> anyway, and, uh, and brought it back and he realized it was the Lord. He t- stretched out his stick on the meat, the broth, and it lit on fire, and he's like, oh my gosh, and the Lord said to him, hey, don't, you don't have to worry, <laughs> I'm not going to kill you, and he made a declaration that the Lord is peace, and that is not just that everything is perfect, but you have one who is a covenant friend fighting with you, right, he's a covenant partner and a covenant friend, so uh, that's what we talked about last week, this, this morning, uh, I'm going in the order, as we're just talking about seven of the covenant names of God, there's many names, many more names of God that we could have uh, spoke on this uh, in this series, but we're just doing seven, and I would say seven redemptive names of God, things that redemption purchased for us, things that Jesus purchased for us. And so um, we see that what, what Jesus has done uh, on, on the cross, and we looked at the first week about Jesus God, right? Who Jesus who? Jesus God. And so in the names of God and in these seven names, you'll see that Jesus is very much seen in the New Testament when you see him, you see the Father, you see he's acting on the Lord's behalf, but you see him as this. And so in order, uh, I'd say uh, the books of the Bible is how we're going through this. So we find ourselves now in Psalms 23, um, and we're talking about the Lord is my shepherd, Jehovah Ra, or, or Yahweh Ra. Um, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, R-A-A-H. The Lord is my shepherd. And David is the one who writes this psalm, but not just this psalm. He writes this, and and they think that this is not just written like when he's a young man, but this is written as he's grown old. As he, in a sense, sits there and looks back 
at his life. Have you ever got to sit with grandpa or, or, or grandma and maybe you just had a really good conversation? Maybe you're going through something and you're just, you don't even realize you're going to come and talk to them about it, but somehow you just spill the beans uh, or, or you just are expressing your heart, and somehow they have a way of telling you that it's going to be all right, and that, uh, you know, it, the tomorrow, you know, you're going to look back, and it, it, they just have a calming. There's a sense of understanding that they have that we don't have just yet uh, because we haven't been there. Yeah? And uh, young people, uh, right now, you might not realize how smart your parents are, uh, but one day, you'll realize how smart your mom and dad are. There'll become a, there actually will come a day you wish you could just sit down with your daddy again and have a conversation and just ask him what he thinks. It's precious. And this is the, this is the, the picture that we see uh, David writing this psalm as the Lord is my shepherd. He's reflecting back over, over his, really his life. So I want to read all of Psalms 23 this morning. And then we're going to just pick out a couple pieces of this. Uh, of this. And there, there's ten promises that are represented here. We're not going to take time to um, I maybe hit, hit what those are. But we're going to just pick out a couple pieces here this morning as we think about and as we look at the Lord. And this is the whole goal in sharing these names and teaching on these, that we would look at the Lord as this in our lives. Uh, that we would draw on him as our peace or as our victory or as our healer this morning as our shepherd. Psalms, uh, uh, Psalms 23, starting in verse 1. And I think I only gave you 1 through 3, on my th- but it's actually 1 through 6. Uh, we're going to read all of it. So here we go. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall... Dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There's, a, there's, there's something, this, this passage is actually probably one of the most popular or famous passages of Scripture um, in, in all of society. Not just in the church, but in society. It's often used at funerals. Um, it's used when, when, uh, just when there's adversity. It's used, and and, and can, you not, can you just hear, if, you, if you've ever spent time reading this or hearing it, there's, there's almost a calmingness to this passage, isn't there? It's just kind of like, you ever feel that? You just, that's God's words, isn't it? As as a shepherd, he just is a a calmingness. And and the reason why is is really, I believe, because how many promises are here? It's like, it's just like, you just hear him saying, the Lord, he's got you, right? And here, let me give you these, the 10 promises that you'll see throughout here. Number one, You'll see provision, and this is that shepherd. The shepherd thinks of everything for the sheep. He's, he's not just thinking about grain. He's thinking about all of it. He's the protection. He's the one that sees and protects, and those are really the two main roles that you see a shepherd uh, that, that, that they function in, a seeing and a protecting. Uh, but number one, provision. Number two, protection. Number three, peace. You see that promise? Number four, these are in order. Uh, you see this promise of restoration. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. You see a promise uh, and, and guidance. And he, there's a promise that he, he'll, guide, he'll guide you, he'll lead you for his name's sake. Uh, there's a promise of confidence. There's a promise of correction. There's a promise of prosperity. There's a promise of anointing. And there's a promise of his goodness, a promise of promises, goodness uh, and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. So the ten promises, protection, provision, peace, restoration, guidance, confidence, correction, prosperity, anointing, and promise. Uh, we could sit and talk about all of those in each verse because they're just so full. But this morning, um, I want to just talk about, I want to talk about restoration and guidance. Um, and maybe just a, a moment about the anointing. It's what I, uh, is interesting what Pastor Evan was talking about this morning, but just the anointing. Um, it, it, that's, a, that's something that a shepherd would apply. 
uh, to wounds. You know, how many, anybody, any, anybody ever hear about the blue stuff, the blue stuff? Anybody, any cattle guy? Okay. Okay. So we got some cattle people in here. Um, a shepherd, we don't really know about shepherding here, but, but if you are a ranch hand or if you around here in Arkansas, quite a few people have cattle. And so kind of being a, a cattle man, you have an understanding of what it is like the shepherd, right? Um, anyway, so let, let's keep going here. Uh, we know that, that, that sheep get scared. Um, they get scared when they don't know the strength and the foresight of the one they're with. This is, we get scared when we don't know the strength and, and the foresight of the one uh, that we're with. Um, I, I, I do in the study of the Lord is our shepherd um, or the Lord is my shepherd, it would be good for us to know that that means we're a sheep in this context, right? And so... Um, Sheep are not necessarily known to be the, the greatest uh, self-sufficient animals. Um, so when you and I try to act self-sufficiently, mm, we're very limited. We don't see very far. Um, matter of fact, if one runs off in a ditch, um, oftentimes the next one will run off in the ditch. Have you ever seen a stampede? Maybe of cows. We were watching Bonanza recently. Uh, we love Bonanza in our home. Um, but just when our boys were little, we used to watch Bonanza all the time, and there would be a stampede. Or, well, sheep are the same way. Like there, they can be a, there could be a stampede. A rabbit could jump out of the bush, and one sheep will take off running, and guess where the next sheep is going to go? Because of a rabbit. Because of a rabbit. Did you know in the church, it's, as, as, as we're sheep, that you know like one little thing can happen over here and it can cause a whole flock to run because of just one rabbit. And you wonder why everybody's running and trampling and, and there's questions about the running and trampling, but if you would find out that there was a rabbit over here, <laughs> then it would be make some things a whole lot more calm, right? Um, and so, so we don't look to, our lead, to the sheep to lead us, do we? Mm -mm. Where do we look? The shepherd. So the Lord is our shepherd. Uh, I love that. So oh, we know that um, if you think about uh, what, what a shepherd does, he keeps a, not. We, we looked at those promises. But if, uh, if, we're, if a sheep is going to lay down, they can't be afraid. They can't be hungry. Okay? That's what he wants us to do. He wants, he, the goal of the shepherd is to, is to raise up a flock, but also to have it reproduce, to keep it in a state where it's not panicked. Uh, but it's healthy, right? That's the ultimate goal of a shepherd is to keep a, a flock safe and healthy and reproducing. Reproduction is as much a part of a shepherd's role as it is uh, just to keep the shepherd or the sheep looking pretty, right? It's all, all these things. So they, they have to be free of fear. Um, did you know fear can cause uh, the, 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 the animal to, to abort? You know, uh, when there, if, there, or if, there's a, if there would maybe be a, um, coming into a drought, they won't even get pregnant. Like they, when they sense, oh, it was this way, it was this way, it was this way, it, it, they, they don't, just their bodies fear. And fear has a, has a big deal to do with even our reproduction, how we reproduce. How about, how about that with just even fear of man? Right? Being afraid of what you're going to say, to be able to share your testimony, to be able to share Jesus and who he is and what he's provided. But you have fear, uh, panic. The, again, the shepherd's goal is to keep from panic, to be safe. He'd bring you in. In, in. in John chapter 10, he talks about bringing them into a den or bringing them into a cave in the one way in Jesus, right? Um, parasites. How many of you know that if, you, if you've ever dealt with animals, um, parasites is a real big deal. You ever see those cows? They have the tags. It's not just for numbers. There, there's, there's actually uh, medicine in that that keep ticks and those kind of things off of the cow, kind of like a flea collar where you put on a cat. And so parasites, you know, little parasites, little things buzzing around your head. Have you ever seen the, the little swaggy thing, like a, like a tube in the field? And, the, and I say swaggy, it would always hang, and it hangs down, and the cows will go underneath of that. Why? Because there's medicine to keep the flies. They'll walk their back underneath of that. They usually put it by the feed. And by doing that, it keeps the flies from constantly biting them all day and their tail constantly. You ever see the side of the shake, the muscle shake, trying to say, get off of here, get off of here. And they don't have hands to smack. 
That's a frustrating thing. Parasites are frustrating. And if you don't know how frustrating they are, then you haven't been to Minnesota in June when the black flies in northern Minnesota, like we're talking like, or Alaska, and, and I'm talking where you can't even think, you, wish you, were, you almost wish you were dead. It's that crazy. They're in your eyes, in your nose. They're just parasites. Have you ever been like that where you're just constantly swatting down thoughts and constantly swatting down things? This is the, the, this is the role of a shepherd to, 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 bring, to bring clarity or to bring uh, safety or to apply ointment, to apply salve, right? Um, thank you, Lord, for that. And then ultimately food. You know, to make sure that you're they're nourished. So I think it's interesting um, how uh, God writes here in, in Psalms through David. And David, he understood about being a shepherd more than probably anyone else because he was a shepherd. He was a shepherd. Uh, shouldn't you be out feeding your, the sheep? You know, remember when he went to battle and David, he, here he comes and Goliath is coming out and he's bringing cheese and some bread to the king or to the, or rather than the commanders in the army and his brothers. And, and so he comes to the front lines and they're like, why don't you go tend the sheep? You remember when they were looking for a king, uh, they had all the brothers and David was just this kind of maybe, yeah, maybe a little redheaded freckled kid. He was just this. You know, another, in other words, not that red, maybe he wasn't red, red-headed. He might have just had a redder, more reddish, ruddy complexion, probably from being out in the sun, right? Because uh, he was a shepherd. And so I wanted you uh, to see this, uh, this, pas- this passage real quick, 1 Samuel 17, 34, as we look at the Lord our shepherd and David un- understanding this. It says, but David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. Somebody say his father's sheep. So now I think this is so cool. David is keeping not his sheep, but his father's sheep. We know that David is called a man after God's own heart. We know um, just as, like uh, Jesus and David, they're kind of like a type in the shadow uh, of one another. And even um, the Lord, he's ke- taking care of uh, our Lord Jesus. He's taking care of those who the Lord has placed in his hands. So they, anyway, let's keep on going here. But he says, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it and I rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned to me, I seized it by the hair. I struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he's defiant defied the armies of the living God. I think it's interesting to, for him to, for us to realize, number one, a shepherd is, is not just a guy standing out there like this. Nah, you know, like they're all going, blah, blah, little Bo Peep lost his sheep, didn't know where to find them. I think we think like little Bo Peep is the shepherd. It's not the case at all. As a matter of fact, the shepherd is the one that killed Goliath. Um. If you were to keep on reading here, you'd find, or not just right here, but you, through, through the story of David, you would find that um, God anointed him to be a king, a shepherd to be a king, or to lead. So a shepherd is to lead. This is interesting, you see, but not just to lead sheep, but to lead people. And, and yet you see that Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. We see that he's killed a lion, a bear, he killed Goliath, a shepherd. He had a staff, he had a sling. He had a rod, and he wanted to build a temple. But the Lord told him that you won't build the temple, but Solomon, your son, will, because you have too much, what? Blood on your hands. So I want to make this clear that a shepherd is not little Bo Peep. A shepherd has to deal with some lions and bears and tigers, oh my, um, but a shepherd has to deal with stinky wounds. A shepherd uh, has to deal with a lot of different things. Um, but one of the things that he has to deal with is he has to be strong enough uh, to kill. And I think that sometimes uh, we don't recognize that in the Lord. I think sometimes we think that we think that it's just oh he, it's just only about comfort. Um, but he, if, if we don't recognize that his rod, and this is go, goes back into that, that honor and that fear of the Lord kind of thought, right? Um, that, he, that the Lord, he's, he's pretty strong. And that's what brings you and me safety. But that's also what causes um, 
Betty sheep to not keep biting Bobby sheep. You know? Because if you, uh, maybe you don't have sheep, but maybe you have chickens, right? Maybe you've seen if you put a new chicken in the pen and they got to establish their pecking order. That's where that comes from. The pecking order, if you put uh, some new chickens with the other chickens, they're going to fight with one another until they peck, 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 peck and go, okay, 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 I'm bloodied and beat up and all of you and I'll take the lower seat and there's just this beating, right? Or these roosters, or you, okay? And so if you were a shepherd of chickens, okay, or if you're a shepherd of sheep, um, then, then you would take your rod and you would whack the one that's... Because my goal is to, you, you can't keep biting. You can't, like if there's one that keeps on taking... If you're a cow in the pasture and if this one bull is running all the other things through the fence, how many of you know you're going to have to do something with that bull? You're going to have to whack the bull in a sense. Or you're going to have to discipline the bull. This is, again, correction. This is part of the shepherd. This is what the Lord does with us. This, his strength causes you and me to recognize not only is he have the ability to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to keep that which is on the outside keep us safe from that, but also from within. Okay, this is important. Because otherwise, uh, we wouldn't realize that, or we, don't, we, we even in the place, um, there could be, in a sense, uh, disease, division among the flock, right? And so this is, a, this is an important uh, thing to look at. Let's keep it going here. Um, I want to I wanna, wanna talk about this. The number one goal of the enemy is uh, to call into question the shepherd's intentions, the enemy would love, again, we're talking about a shepherd, we're talking about sheep. And again, it would be, or I haven't even said this yet, but um, who God is to you, whether or not he's your shepherd, if he's your shepherd, or his position, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is not our shepherd, the Lord's my shepherd. Is he your shepherd? Okay. If he's your shepherd, his position in your or my life determines our condition. When he's in the right position, the condition of my life Man, his, his position greatly affects my condition. If I don't have a shepherd, parasites. If I don't have a shepherd, I'm not laying down. If I don't have a shepherd, I'm going to be looking for food. If I don't have a shepherd, there's a whole lot of promises here that I'm not partaking of. I'm going to look to be self-sufficient. If I don't have a shepherd, guess who I'm going to look to? The rabbit runners. Another, this is a big deal. Okay, um, and, and so the, the number one goal of the enemy is to call into question the shepherd's intentions. And we see this in uh, one, <clears throat> one of the greatest, uh, when, I, when I'm thinking about this, is this something that on Wednesday night, Mona had mentioned again, it's a, it's a word that I think is really important as we look at the Lord as my shepherd. And, and it's so important for us to see him in that place and all of those promises because so often in our lives, we're looking, in Matthew chapter 6, we're looking out for ourselves. Matthew 6, 25 through 33, he says, Don't consider, take up no thought for, for what you're going to eat or for what you're going to drink. Don't you know the Lord, he, he's thinking about those things. But we find ourselves in this place of self-sufficiency. Because we're concerned, we're self-concerned because we don't think God's got our concern, okay? And, uh, but Mona had mentioned on Wednesday night, one of the, one, one of the ways that the enemy uh, comes is something that, uh, and I shared this, um, where this statement came from. We were leading a youth camp, um, or our group at youth camp, and there was a, a young girl who had a seizure uh, in IHOP late at night. And uh, by the time the ambulance got there and we got to bed, it was probably 3 in the morning. And um, I was doing the service that next morning. I found myself not really actually even going to bed uh, just because of all the, the dealing with. And, like, I know I need to address the kids because it was just com complete pandemonium uh, among the kids. And so that next morning, I really wanted to uh, just kind of bring us back a calm into the sense and, uh, and, and talk to the kids. And one of the things... I was like, Lord, what are you saying this? this? It just feels like we're at camp, like we're in the middle of really good things, a God moment, and then like the enemy comes in and just kind of does a kaboosh. Now, what do you do about that? Because there's a lot of questions, but not just questions, questioning. 
See, God doesn't mind questions. Matter of fact, he says, seek me, and you'll what? Find me. He, he, if you want to know something, he, he loves questions. As a matter of fact, he, he wants to bring light where there's darkness. He wants you and I to understand. What he doesn't like so much, though, matter of fact, he hates, is questionings. Because questionings is judging what he said. So you know what he said, but now you're questioning what he said. So there's a the total different thing between a question and questionings. And one of the things that we had talked about, the enemy comes with a question. Again, questioning, is that really what God said? I know God said that, but you think that's right? Would you do it that way? I mean, can't you, don't you think there's more than, think about this as, as, as Satan or Lucifer. Don't you think that, the, don't you think this, don't you think this, don't you think, and God made it, had made it clear where the decree is. Don't you think, don't you think, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And this is what was going on at that, that where the statement came. The Lord comes with the direction, the enemy comes with questions. Questions of not so much just like, uh, a question like I'm seeking the Lord, but questioning, questioning God's word or questioning a promise or questioning the character of God. And so the enemy would love to question or get you and me to question our shepherd. Question our shepherd's judgment. To question our shepherd's seeing. To question our shepherd's protection. Question, again, well, it's 2023. I mean, can you believe? I mean, surely he didn't mean that. I mean, look at here. To, and this is important. This is important. Did you know a sheep doesn't see as far as a shepherd? Thank you, Lord. And so we, the, he would love to get us, you, you and me, to think irreverent thoughts towards the shepherd. Think about this. We talked about this last week. Irreverent thoughts simply says that God can't. He doesn't. He doesn't see. He can't protect. He can't. These are these are big. Th- these is a these are a really big thing to think to call into question the promises of God to call into question the Lord's righteous decree to call into question and and so. Um, let me let me let me just when we talk about when questions come, uh, questions come for the, for the uh, concerning the Lord or concerning one of the best things that you and I could do, rather than going and asking our friend, do you think God da, 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 is asking Him? This is so big. This is so big. Um, and and in, in this day and age, what what I found is uh, is there's a lot of you could call it um, just questioning the way you were taught you know you ever, anybody ever question questioning the way you're taught questioning what was once true so we're questioning instead of going back to the source and finding out what why is lord what well, show me in your word show me what you say asking him asking him why did you do this jeremiah 29 11, i know the thoughts and plans i have for you declares the lord so if he knows the thoughts why am i asking this person the thoughts this is so big. As a child of God, the Bible tells us that we are led by his, the Spirit of God. As a child of God, he says that his children know his voice. So let me just say this to you. If you have a question uh, uh, concerning something that God said in, or in his word, rather than going just to all of your friends, ask the Lord. And, and, and then find what he says about it in, his, in the word. And then you take that to the bank. Then you can stand on that. Build your house on that. Not somebody else's word, but the word of God. Build your house. Ask him, what does he say about it? What does God say about it? What does God say? Uh, Ask him. You know, one of the other things that would be good to do is as we're talking about asking a shepherd about, Lord, what do you say about this? What do you say about my protection? What do you say about my provision? What do you say about my peace? What do you say about my children? What do you say? These, all of these things. Ask the shepherd. Ask the shepherd. Well, why? Because he's the one that leads us. He's the one that guides us. Can I tell you this? Um, 
this morning, uh, re- more recently, uh, actually probably three weeks ago, I was having a conversation uh, with John Grunewald. He's one of the, uh, the members on, on our board. Um, at, and I tell you, one of the things for me, um, I just really respect him. He just seems like a, a man of great wisdom. He's great at asking questions. And, uh, and so just as gleaming and coming under and asking, I had scheduled some, some times with him um, just, to, just to talk. Right, just to throw out a couple of questions, and so the way he he uh, he he said, why don't, why don't you do this? Why don't you email me two questions and uh, in advance, and we'll just we'll talk about them, you know? So and so I thought, okay, well, how many of you know that's kind of important to figure out the right questions? You're like, right? So I'm like, okay, what do I want to ask? What do I want to ask? And and uh, and so I asked him, t- typed a couple of questions. Uh, one of them actually had to do uh, concerning church leadership. Um, and then uh, I think I, the other one was concerning spiritual disciplines that work best in his life. And so we were talking along those lines, and uh, he was talking about uh, where he had went to church as a young man, and he went through Bible school, and, and then he ended up going uh, to this other church. And he said, actually, that was, the, that was the first place, and that was the first pastor I actually trusted, and that was Pastor Willie George out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, Pastor Willie George, he's a, he's, he's a cowboy guy. Uh, if you ever have watched Willie, uh, Pastor Willie George, um, he had this the Gospel Bill show, which was, uh, it's a great, if you Google it, Google it, YouTube it, you'll be blessed just to watch those old Western uh, shows. But he was, he was a, he's a man's man, still is. He's, uh, he's a hunter, he's a man's man. And he said, uh, he said, you know, he was actually the first pastor I ever trusted. And so even though I'd only asked two questions, um, the next question was like, well, why do you suppose you trusted him? Because how many of you know it's important that you trust the place and the pastor where you, where you, where you attend church or where you're a part? Because that's the place where you're fed. That's a place that protection, correction, restoration, all of these things happen. Matter of fact, it says this uh, in Jeremiah 3.15, I will give you pastors according to my own heart who will lead you and feed you with understanding. Why does he say that after his own heart? Well, because he leads you for his namesake. In other words, if the sheep don't look good, it's on the shepherd. And so God would say, I'm going to give you pastors or under shepherds. That's what that word pastor means. If you were to put up Jeremiah 3.15, you'd see some translations in your book, Bible might say, uh, it might say shepherd. I'll give you shepherds according to my own heart who will lead you and feed you in wisdom and understanding. But others, he says, I'll give you shepherds or I'll give you pastors. And so I asked him, I said, so why do you think, uh, why do you think you, you trusted Pastor Willie? And he said, now that's a good question. And I was like, this is John saying this. And I was like, yeah, that was a good question, you know. Um, and so he said, well, he said, I, 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 think I'd, I think it would be this. He wasn't afraid to deal with tough things. And he wasn't afraid to deal with rumors. And I thought, wow, that's pretty powerful. And I, and I can tell you, um, as, as just even as, as getting ready for these, these series or the series, and, and I, I had Googled um, shepherd, shepherd on my notes, right? And I found in 2014, uh, for me, my own, in my notes, you know, my, on my phone, I had the word shepherd and looking it up, and I was doing a study for me, and what does it look like to be a shepherd? What does it look like to be a shepherd? And one of the things back in 2014 or 15 um, I put on there was don't be afraid of blood. And, uh, and sometimes I can tell you, for me, that's one, of the, that's one of the things as far as cleaning a deer, no problem. But when I'm dealing with people, sometimes blood is hard for me to deal with. Not talking about physical blood, I'm talking about being able to deal with tough things. And, um, and, and when John had said that, it just so went up on the inside of me about just being, and I'm, and I'm known to be very candid and very, I'm going to be the same everywhere. But what I found is that from, sometimes from a pulpit, I, I wouldn't address certain things. And so this morning, I'm going to address something. And it just happens to go with th- this message. And one of them, and this is not just a correction, but I'll just say this. If you have a question about the will of God in your life, ask him. If you have a question about something that was anything going on, rather than going to somebody else, come ask me. 
I was talking with somebody very trusted recently, and they told me that they've had many people come to them. I don't know who these people are. No names were given. Um, but And ask them, what's going on in the church? And I could say, I don't know what you're talking about. I said to this multiple times. This has happened in two or three different conversations in the last month. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, other than the fact that Jake, my brother and sister-in-law, they, they moved to Minnesota starting back in, gosh, the last two years, two years ago, it has been go, going on in their heart. Um, and they, they made that transition the 1st of June, end of May, 1st of June. And so I don't, I, I, that was them following the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. Um, there was, uh, and, there, and I'm just talking about what, what's going on. Uh, part of my, my goal is to protect the sheep. Okay, um, so there are things that, that happen that you'll never know about, and I won't tell you, because love covers. There's, there was, there's been affairs that you know nothing about. Hello. And you won't. Not in my staff. Not in my leadership. Absolutely not. But among those that are sitting next to you. But you know nothing about that. Why? Because you can trust me. But you know what? The same way you can trust me, if you have a question, you better come to me. Because it matters. I, I absolutely love questions. Love questions. Hey, and, and, and even to where if, so, if I'm making a decision saying, hey, well, did you think of this? Oh, man, that's a great idea. That was just me coming up with an idea because I'm an idea guy. But I, that's a great idea. Let's go with that. That's, let's go with that. But when something goes forward and, and now it's questioning, what I find is questioning is talking among one another. Yeah. Never coming to the source. Why do you think a third of the angels fell? Because of questioning. Questioning. You think they were talking to the Lord about it? No, there was rebellion. And so let's just make this clear. We are all sheep. David was the shepherd of the Lord's sheep. I'm not your shepherd. I am an under-shepherd of the Lord's sheep. I am a sheep as well, but I am a shepherd of the Lord's sheep. You are the Lord's sheep. I'm one of the Lord's sheep. And I heard this said recently, actually, uh, uh, I heard it first from Mona, but then I heard it um, through Brother Keith Moore. And he said, you know, so many times, and we know the Bible tells us in Romans, that all authority is from the Lord. You actually cannot serve the Lord and not be under authority. It's impossible. But somehow we get this understanding and idea that we're just, uh, and it is true, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. So I'm your brother. In the family of God, we're brothers and sisters. But in the army of God, there's rank. And things are for keeps. This is why, because we're playing for life and death. So God has, there's an order that he brings things. Okay? When, when the Lord says, I'm going to give you a shepherd after my own heart, it's not a man. And if you're hearing, there's an anointing this is, that, that God places in the, in the house this, as the same way a general, he is to command an army or to command a group of people. I'm not the, I'm not the five-star general. I'm, I'm just... Uh, 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 maybe a one-star general commanding this clan. But, but orders come, and, and protection comes, and, and, and restoration comes. Uh, what? How? The Word of God coming from this place. Light comes when the Word of God, but only when the Word of God can be received. And so, so the reason why the enemy works so hard to question the shepherd, because as long as... My view of him is tainted. I will struggle to receive or believe anything that he says in his word. And when that's the case, I will find myself at a distance from the shepherd. And I'll find myself not having the tending that I am to have. Have to have. This is part of this is the enemy's work. The enemy comes with questions, questioning, questioning, questioning. Well, can you, if God's that, well, how come he didn't do that? And how come he didn't do that? Because now, guess what? The promises that are given to you, you won't receive, you won't believe, and you'll, he'll lead you over to the still water and this green pasture, and guess what? You won't drink from that brook. 
You'll stop drinking from the brook you once drank from. This is what I've seen. I've seen where the, something in life, Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. John 10.10. 10. So Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I have come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. Verse 11, John 10.11. I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. But when I look, when, when life happens and the enemy gets blamed, the enemy the, the one that is the one that caused it, and the shepherd gets blamed, what you see is, no longer do where you once drank from the brook of God's promise for your provision in your life. I don't know about that. I better go figure out a way to make it on my own. Because, you know, we had all this in line, all this in line, and everything was good. And then, man, 06 happened, and, and, and I, all my painting, come, all, just the, all income stopped. And I had this much overhead and blah, 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 and had to file this. And then I, I mean, this is, these are real things. But who, who gets the blame for that? Well, God, if, God, if, God if, if he loved me, then why would he allow that to happen? So now, where I once drank from the Lord's provision, now I'm, okay, it could happen with healing. Maybe you were praying for Johnny to be healed, okay? And th- th- let me go back here for a second. So the only thing I had known about, and I don't know about anything else, uh, was my brother Jake uh, and then moving to Minnesota. We're not moving to Minnesota, Okay. We're not, we're here. Okay. You were not bought off. We're not being, we're, I mean, I'm, I'm here. I'm not hired. I'm called. And you know, sometimes it's important for you, me to make that declaration to you, just like Paul had to make it to the churches. Every, if you read this, I, Paul, an apostle by the will of God, I, Nate, a pastor by the will. You'll see this Paul saying over and over, I'm not, I'm, I'm not paid. I'm called. Okay. And this is important to know. The other, the other uh, when I'm thinking about tran- transitions or big things that have happened that maybe there's like, oh, yeah, I can't, haven't seen them. I think of Matt and Abby Nowicki, who were in this house and experienced tremendous heartbreak and loss. And let me just tell you this. We experienced tremendous heartbreak and loss because if one part hurts, the whole part hurts. And so many of you are still lifting them up. And I would say this, keep doing that. Keep doing that. Because it's not God's will that any, not, not talking about being divided or what. I'm just talking about when, when a great storm in life causes us to be shaken from the place that life was flowing. That's not the Lord. So yeah, the, the, I'm, not say, I'm not saying, oh, they're missing God. I'm saying there was a great storm. Okay. And so that, that is one, okay? And then the, the next one that I can think of, the only other thing I can think of is that Juan and Michelle, our worship leaders, are, a month ago decided they're going to move to Minnesota to be with family and ultimately to carry the message of Christ to Juan's side that doesn't know Christ. So right here, they're, by the end of um, September, beginning of October, they're moving there. They had visited with their family, uh, and they said I, the time, it's not easy to leave this place, but I, I felt like... Uh, there's an open door because I haven't had for years. And I got to talk with mom and or my, with dad, and and they got to share some hard words with me. And I realized that I got to make some adjustments so that I might reach them. You know, like Paul said, uh, you know, I make I become this so that I might reach one. If he reaches one, and so that's all I know about. But if you know about something, if you know about something. Rather than questioning what's going on, question, come, come ask, because I don't know. And say, I'll stand in agreement with you, because I don't want junk happening. What, in my heart, here's where I'm at. I believe the church is at a, the best place it's been in 15 years. As long as I've been here, it's at the best place. I can tell you in my own heart, I'm the best I've ever been in my life, because I'm the best I've ever been spiritually. And so there's not, I'm not afraid to address these things. And it was just like Lord saying, hey. And, and even this morning, it was like this, oh, you don't know what they're going to say. Like, would, you, you don't say that. Don't say that. No, I need to own the place that the Lord has called me because this is where protection and provision and peace in this house. And I never stand in this, in this pulpit to, to bring a word, and this is one of the things, because I had a conversation recently along those lines, that, I would, would, that my words would be manipulative 
to, from that conversation. And that was, I had to pray in the Holy Spirit for a while to say, Lord, you, I, I, this, you, this better. <laughs> Lest any message that comes up here comes from here or here or here instead of there. You'll notice in my office, if you've ever been there, besides the big bucks, the biggest picture on the wall is 2 Timothy 4.17. And the Lord stood next to me and strengthened me so that through me, his message would be fully proclaimed. I'm not here for a paycheck. Matter of fact, that's been some of the biggest battles of my life and me staying here is because of a paycheck that I used to be able to go make and get my own. And I'm not limited in ability. God gave it to me. It's not myself. But that's something I got to lay down at his feet. There's been times I've tried to pick it up because I I knew what I could go get extra. And the Lord would grab my heart so hard. And he'd say, did I ask you to pick that up? And I have to lay it down. I have to repent. And, all, and even sometimes lose what I could have been phenomenal. So I'm, I'm bringing this clarity because this is sometimes the Lord would love to have a tough conversation with you and me when he said, would say, why don't you talk to Job? Okay. Why don't you gird yourself up like a man? Why don't you pull your, you know, if, you gotta, if, you're, if you're tough, if you're going to talk to me like a man, if you got a man's man parts, he said, then let's have some conversation. Come on. And he said, who do you think you are? Where were you? Tell me how this breathes. Tell me about this. Tell me about this. And there had been all these questionings for the Lord. And I'll tell you, the Lord would like to bring you and me to, into that place and say, hey, are you questioning what he's promised? Are we questioning his character? Are we questioning his ability to restore? I'm telling you, when we're talking about the death and the dead bones, instead of prophesying life to them, I'm under the wrong spirit. In Acts chapter 2, he said this, and, and this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. He said, in the last days, and he's talking about the outpouring of the Spirit. Well, he was prophesying that, and he said, this is that. All the way back in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, he said, when the Spirit of God is poured out on his people, they will prophesy to things. Young men and women will prophesy. They'll say what God says. They'll speak to dead bones instead of talk about how dead they are. They'll speak life to things in situations. The dreams will lead them, not just what, what, what is. They'll have dreams. Old men, look at this in Acts, Acts chapter 2, 16. That's the product of the Spirit of God. Dreams are, where well, you find that dreams are filled with hope. Hope. The Spirit of God being poured out. And this, is, this is what God wants for you and me. He wants to pour out His Spirit upon us. And He wants what's coming out of us to be spirit words. Not just natural flesh words. Words that bring life. Words that bring Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Now the, the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, self-control. But the works of the flesh, if you were to go right back up, are not... It's not just sex or overeating. It's divisions and yuckiness. All the, you look it up. Yuckiness. Because that's, it makes the Lord want to vomit. What makes him want to vomit? If, you've, if you have children and in your house there was strife or division and you couldn't solve it for your kids, but they just are constantly fighting with one another. Maybe somebody shot him with this airsoft gun. Okay? And then, so he's going to shoot you back. But you shot both of your brothers, so then they each get to get you back. And so she got shot twice, they're going to each shoot you twice, because you shouldn't have shot twice. You shot twice. No, I'm shooting you twice. Well, I'm shooting you twice. And as a little man, you feel like you're getting the short end of the stick. You know? Might have happened. (laughs) Point blank, just... Ouch, right? In a family of boys. 
And you can't calm the other one down as much as you try. They're just frustrated, angry. It's not a fun thing, is it? No. Um, God doesn't like that kind of thing with one another, period. Let's keep going here. So we're talking again about the Lord is our shepherd. The Lord is our shepherd. Matthew 9, 36. Jesus was moved with com compassion when he saw the multitude. He saw them having no shepherd. What does that mean? They had no light or, protector, or protection. There, there was no light and protective voice leading them. So he was moved with compassion and he said, hey, make them sit down. I want to show them my provision. Make them sit down. I want to talk to them a little longer. Make them sit down. Um, 2 Corinthians uh, 4, 4. And this is, what, again, we're talking about why the enemy uh, would love to qu the questionings because this is how he works. He blinds. See, where there's questions, there's darkness. So when I'm questioning what God says um, and I'm in the dark, any reasonable answer will suffice. Not God's word, but any reasonable answer. Like, when, I, when I'm questioned, well, why did I, then I'm just, I, I, I get here instead of here. Just, I get here. And, and my mind is now conformed instead of transformed by the, the word of God as the foundation. But this is his strategy. The God of this age blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. One translation says it this way, blinded their minds lest they believe. Lest they believe. Somebody asked me recently, um, how do I, what do I, what do I tell somebody that is uh, asking, how do you know that Jesus is real? How do you know? And Hebrews 11, 6 is what popped up in my heart. Now, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Verse 7. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The blinding of the mind is so that you and I would be here instead of here. That's the whole goal. Because faith is not of here, it's of here. So when words are given, when, when, I, when words come to me and all I can think is up here, and this is where I'm led, then guess what? He'll whoop me every time. Every time. When I'm caught up here, when I'm caught up here, I just don't know why. 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 Well, maybe just go ask the Lord. What do I need to know here? Psalms 119. What's the light? His word. Is it counsel, more talking to 16 more people and sharing my hurt. You know, it's crazy. If that works so well, we should be far less. We should have far less of that. And this is also why it's important to remember when, when you question God and you bring that question to somebody else, you just put, you just tainted your well thought by the enemy's case that you've thought about for 1,600 hours and you came in now in 10 minutes exposed God to a whole bunch of belittling talk but not only exposed him to these things, you now tainted their water of that young man or that young woman or that person of who God is. So now they're going to have to drink through that straw as they hear the word of God, they got to drink through that straw. As they sit before the Lord, they, that questioning, yeah. those seeds yeah. that you planted. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so you know that's the same way with your friend. You know, if you're talking to your friend, you talk to your friend about John, and then next time they see John, guess what? They're going to have to fight and cast down those thoughts about John because you told me all about what John was and what he wasn't in all of about this long. I knew John all my life, but now I, maybe I don't know John. Yeah, yeah. That's true. 
It's the same way with uh, we're talking about a pastor. And I, and I would say that this is even more detrimental because both the Lord and the Lord's authority here on this earth to feed the sheep with wisdom and understanding, now you're tainted to be able to drink from the stream or to feed on the grass or to hear the word that's being taught without hearing it in a tainted way. So you won't drink from what is being said. And so you'll deceive yourself into sitting in a pew thinking you're being fed when the whole time you're actually starving. And you wonder why life is hard and you wonder why this is going this way and you don't have direction and you don't have this and you don't have that. Can I tell you why? Because you're not feeding. Because you're not letting somebody... Someone, no, no, you're not under the Lord's structure of authority and allowing somebody the leading. So these promises that he promised as you come to be equipped, you're going to find your equipment is lacking. And guess what? In this day and age, we need equipment. And it's not a, a man, it's the word. But if I can't, if, if I don't believe what that person has my best interest in heart, when they speak the word, I'm not going to hear the word the way it was actually said and intended and what God had meant. And that every that they're saying that because of this. I don't know what's going on. Matter of fact, this is partly what's going to actually be happening, and it's coming up here. I, I, I extended and talking with John Grunewald. It's been a prayer for a couple of years in my heart about, and I wasn't even going to share this, but the, here it is. Because um, there's just not secrets with me. Um, and it wasn't secret, but I, I said, Lord, I, I know that we're supposed to have leadership in this house that's not just in the staff. Those that, would, 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 that are, and the Bible tells us in, in, in Timothy and in Titus, uh, the qualifications, and even in Acts, uh, how, to, how to find those, those people. And so the Lord had laid, not me, the Lord had laid some names, some, some men of the house on my heart and their spouses. The Bible says that they have to be tested. They have to be a man of one wife. They have to be uh, uh, not given to love of money, not given to drunkenness, not given, like all these things. They, their wife has to not be a gossip. Okay, there, there's, there's it's pretty big qualifications, okay? And so um, I invited seven, of, uh, seven couples from this house uh, to, to be a part of that. And, uh, and I'm going to just to, to, so that that way it's not like so much of a staff church, because that's never been our heart. Um, we have a huge team of coordinators and all these kind of things, but maybe just praying together or things that need to be prayed about or maybe, in a sense, knowing some things on the outside that need to be brought to attention, a question that would be brought so that an answer would be, you know. But the reality is if there's a question and it's going out here, it really should just go to the horse, right, or to whoever it's at. That's what the Bible says. If there's an offense in your heart, go to that person. It doesn't say... Can, do you think that they meant this by that? No, it says go to that person. Ask them. Okay? This is huge. 2 Timothy three fourteen through 17. But as for you, continue in these things that you've learned. This is so big. Oh, thank you, Lord. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17. This is in the time of adversity. Can I tell you that 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, a lot transpired? In 1 Timothy, the church was in its heyday. It was in 2 Timothy, there's great persecution. Great persecution. And so Paul's having to remind Timothy about, well, continue in the things that you have learned and firmly believe since you know from who, from whom you've learned them. But before you knew something else, before you heard about this, before this persecution, before that, continue in those things. From infancy... From infancy, when you were a young person in Christ and you heard the word of God and you believed that like childlike faith, hold back to that. Get back to that. That was a Paul talking to a Timothy. That was a Paul. That was an order of an authority talking to a young man. It was an elder, an apostle, an overseer, a pastor to Timothy. Paul is Timothy's pastor and saying, listen, bud, 
You need to hold back to the things that you once received and the things you received as a young babe in Christ when you would put and allow God to speak anything to you and you would receive it as such. Get back to that because I need you preaching that in the pulpit. This is Paul talking. And he says, um, the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation, not Well, they said this, and over here, and over this. The Holy Scriptures, able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. All Scripture is God-breathed. It's useful for instruction, for conviction, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, fully equipped for every good work. This is how God works. He brings us His Word. This is how He still works. This is how He leads us. This is how He guides us. This is how every one of those ten promises is brought to you and me. Through his word. He sees and he protects. You know, when the Holy Spirit was left and he said, it's better that I go away because I'm going to send you this Holy Spirit. Uh, His Holy Spirit. He's going to lead and guide you. He's going to show you things to come. He knows what you need and he brings God's word in that season. He reminds you of God's word. This is how he leads, how he protects, how how he corrects. This is everything is about you and I hearing his word. This is why it's so important that you and I don't have a clogged filter between us and the Lord. So when I hear what God's saying to me, I know I'm hearing it from a God who loved me so much that he gave his only son that he didn't come. He says this in John chapter 3, 16 and 17. I did not come to condemn the world. I'm not coming and telling you this because I, I'm condemning you. I'm coming to, he had to clarify Yet again. So it's important that the filter between here is clear. It's important that the filter between you and your spouse is clear. If, if, if you wanted to whoopee last night and you didn't get whoopee, okay, and, and you, you thought you made yourself clear, now tomorrow morning because uh, the net, you, you, you thought you would put the cookies in the cookie jar, so get what you were hoping for, okay? Help me out. And the next morning, you're going to have coffee, and usually you pour both cups. But, pfft. you know what that is? The filter's not clear. Any, is there anybody know what I'm talking about? Any guys in here? Any ladies? I thought they were going to do this, but they didn't do And so, it's, mani- it's manipulative. Instead of saying, hey, instead of communicating clearly, instead of going, hey, asking a question, why? Ask the question, why? Well, you fell asleep. I did? I wasn't tired. Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. So, John 10.10. We have to settle this in our hearts concerning the Lord. John 10, 10 through 16. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that you might have life and that you might have it in its fullness. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. I'm reminded, he who did not spare his own son, how will he also not freely give you all things? Okay? Laid his own life down for his sheep. Um... He said, uh, verse 12, the hired hand is not the shepherd, and, and the sheep are not his own. When he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. And then the wolf pounces on them and scatters the flock. You, that's, what I, that's one of the things that, that I found right here. When, when you're not willing to stand up and say something because you might get bit or cut or whatever, don't be afraid of blood. And when I, when I didn't clarify, when it said don't be afraid of blood, what I had seen in that was my hand. Don't be afraid of blood. Was it was in my notes? It was don't be afraid of the, uh, of blood to go in and know that it might that really might hurt. If you got to protect a sheep and you got to grab him by the beard and pull him back from his mouth, you think David might have had a cut or two on him? Think he had a battle scar? Yep, absolutely. He said um, he abandons the sheep and runs away, but then the wolf pounces on them and scatters the flock. The man runs away because he's a hired servant and is unconcerned for the sheep. 
But the shepherd is concerned for the sheep. And I think that's one of the, that's one of the hardest things sometimes is your genuine, it's, it's the love of God that's been placed in you or a shepherd's heart. That there's an anointing that in that way. And so if I was to try to do what I'm called to do in my own strength, I would have PTSD. Having experienced drama and all this kind of stuff, I remember when I first started not understanding the and, and really honoring the office, I remember talking about I had a way better name, and I didn't have, all, have to deal with all the stuff when I simply ran a contracting company. Had a better name, I made more money, all of the things I could I sit, and, and now I feel like I'm getting chewed on, and I'm trying to do the best by, and I'm, I, and, I, and I remember I wanted to, I wouldn't tell anybody what, some of the times things would, would happen, but I would talk to my wife, and I remember one time uh, the Lord spoke so clear to me, he said, your friends don't need an explanation, your enemies won't believe one, so shut up. So just in my own conversation, like I don't need it at all. But the concern for the sheep, it's not my own heart. It's a heart of the shepherd that God put places in there. That we have a, 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 has a heart of a shepherd. He'll run out in the middle of your whatever's going on. You went over there. You went and got yourself tangled. It was your stupidity, my stupidity. And you know what he does? He comes running. I ran off. I got lost. He leaves the rest, and he comes and finds me, and he picks me up, and he cleans me off, and he carries me on his shoulder because he loves me. Do I know he loves me? Do I know he loves me? I got to know he loves me. I got to know that he'll pick me up. I got to know that he, he, he's thinking about me. He's, he, all the time, you know, and I don't know it, but you see him doing this. His mouth is just moving. And all he's doing it the whole time is he's counting the, how many hairs he's got here. In other words, he's like, he's making sure he's got the hundred. And you thought he was talking to himself and he lost his mind. No, he was counting the whole time. He's just making sure, oh, yep, there's Johnny. There's the 99, 98, 90, 100. Where's Bill? Bill? Oh, there he is. Okay, all right, here we go. I mean, your hairs are numbered. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't slumber. This is the Bible. He loves you. It's not he loves me, he loves me not. It's he loves me, he loves me, he loves me, he loves me, he loves me. And because he loves me, because he loves me, anyone who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He's a rewarder. He's for my good. He's for your good. I am the good shepherd, verse 14. I know my sheep. My sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them in as well, and they will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. I love that. They will listen to my voice. How do you recognize the voice of fear or the, or the voice of, the Bible tells us that God isn't given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. How do I recognize when God's speaking or when the enemy's speaking? Which spirit is speaking? The word spirit is the word pneuma. It means breath, wind, or spirit. That word's translated breath, wind, or spirit. Where you see spirit, it's pneuma. How do I know who's talking, breathing, the fruit? If what I'm hearing is producing fear, it's not the shepherd's voice. Pastor Evan had shared a, a, a video with, with me. Um, uh, uh, this it was kind of it was kind of loud, so I didn't share it because it was just kind of giggly and and just kind of pretty loud. But it was these sheep out in this pasture, and people were trying to go here, sheepy, sheepy, sheepy. But it was more like ah, la, 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 la. okay, that was the, the what the sheep, the shepherd did in a different language or whatever, and he would call the sheep, and the sheep would come. Well, all the sheep were scattered, and here one person went down there and tried to use the same call, and the sheep were looked up and were like. Huh. You know, kept on eating. And then uh, another one came down. Three different people tried to, you know, imitate the shepherd and couldn't. And then the shepherd went down to the fence and he said, Hey, sheepy, sheepy, sheepy. And all the sheep went. Because <laughs> my sheep know my voice. And the strangers I don't follow. So, so let me tell you, 
if, if what is being produced in me is not found in Galatians 2 or 5, 22 through 23, recognize what's speaking. And, and I would say this, bring, go, go to the Lord and get clarity or go to that person. This is where, this is where if, if you and I are being bombarded because of a relationship or because of something that's going on and it's not peace, love, and of a sound mind, then number, I, I go to the Lord and or go to them. And get clarity there. Bring restoration, repentance. Let grace, let grace work. He gives grace to the humble. This is an important thing. Like I, I don't, I don't, I'd rather, I'd rather be righteous than right. What does that mean? God's way, not like oh, holy is I. I want God's way more than I want to be right. I just want. I want restoration. This is what God wants to do. He is our shepherd. He restores my soul. I'm going to give you a few scriptures that you can take, take home and, and, and look up, but I want to just close with this about restoration because here's what I found. Um, we believe in our heart. Our heart. Our heart's pretty important. If you've been here for any length of time, we talk about it quite often in Proverbs chapter uh, 4. Guard your heart. With all diligence, for out of it flows everything. Issues. It actually means issues, meaning the pathways of your life. Your path of your life is determined by what's in your heart. And do you know what I found? Broken bowls, broken buckets, broken hearts struggle to hold what I put in them. Though I want to fill, uh, I, I remember uh, trying to water uh, these trees, but I had a hole in my bucket, and so I dip it out of the pond, and then try to get over to the tree as fast as I can, and by the time I got to the tree, I, I didn't want to have to go all the way back to the shop to get the bucket. I had this one that's broken, it had some holes in the bottom, but I thought I could make it, and I only got two trees, and by the time I get over there, I got that much water from a full bucket, and I'm going back and forth, I'm taking four or five trips, and it's all this toil because my bucket is broken, because my bucket is hurt, because my bucket is, has holes in it. And so I, though I want to hold faith, though I, see, here's what, what, what happens, is when I have a broken heart, what, what actually is going on, the Bible says in Hebrews, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the substance of what you hope for. When my heart is broken, hope won't be a part of my life. Hope won't. I, I, I'll, I'll struggle to hold hope. I'll struggle to help hold hope concerning when my heart's broken with the Lord and I, He disappointed me. I'll struggle to hope in His promise. And therefore, I won't be able to re truly receive the substance of His word. I'll struggle to have the hope. I won't even, faith is the substance of what I'm hoping for. Let me say this hope, you're going to have to have hope. You're going to have to have, allow yourself to see the picture to really, like, his word says this, but hope, and I got his word on it, but hope, it, all, these, these work together. You're re concerning a relationship, concerning uh, having, getting a vehicle, and God providing your, or getting you a house, or, or having a child when you haven't been able to have one, and you've tried lots of times, and now what was supposed to be fun has moved into work. Hope less. Why? Because disappointment, because crushed. But what does he do? What does the shepherd do? He restores my soul. So let, just take, for just a moment, what I, what, I, what I had in my heart out of all of this was not just to bring all of those things together, but to bring back a restoring of a soul, of my soul, of your soul, of this house's, the soul. Hearts made whole. Now, a couple of scriptures and then we're going to just let the, the Lord heal this morning, okay? And we're not going to receive communion and all that. Well, we guess we could. I'm just thinking of time. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, we're going to receive communion. That was dishonoring. Jeremiah 30, 17 says this, I will restore to health. I will restore health to you and heal your wounds. We're just, again, we're, I'm building the case of who God said he is. And what he wants to do. Maybe you've been broken in your heart. You've experienced disappointment. It could be in your family. It could be in a relationship. It could be financially. It could be 
one of a hundred ways, okay? I will restore health to you and I will heal your wounds. Luke 19, 10. I came to seek and to save that which is lost. That word save there means to pick up that which is broken, caught in the gutter. You've fallen down in this muck, in this mire. The sheep is caught in this junk or, and you've fallen in. You can't get out. You just, you're in the struggle of the mind. He said, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. Luke 19, 10. Isaiah 57, 7, uh, 57, 15. NIV says this, for this is what the high and exalted one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and a holy place, but also with the one who, oh, excuse me, I, my, my computer did a blip. For this is what the, what the high and exalted one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and a holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit. He says, I live in heaven, but I also live here. I'm a shepherd. I see from above. Oh, but I'm also with my sheep. He says, I also live with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite, those who are broken. Luke 4.18. I love this is this picture of Jesus. Luke 4.18 and 19. I came. I came. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is the anointing, the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is upon me. The anointing breaks the yoke. The anointing is what brings a different word, the anointing. Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me to proclaim the news, good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. Next verse, to proclaim the year of the Lord, to heal the brokenhearted. This brokenhearted, set free from brokenness. In other words, that word there, to heal the brokenhearted, that word broken is like uh, you would, would have, it comes from this word where if you had the vat of grapes and you were making wine, you were stepped on and you were crushed. You were broken. You were that which we once held in you like faith, I held this trust and this hope. Maybe it's in a friend. Maybe it's in the Lord. Maybe, but, you, but in a sense, you were broken. You were stepped on. You were crushed. Your heart was broken. But Jesus said, I've come. I'm the good shepherd. I've come to heal the brokenhearted. Thank you, Lord. To restore the soul. How does he restore our soul? with his words, with his presence. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For years, Jesus came by his people. And in Luke chapter 4, 30 years having having been born, having grown up, having been in the temple. He sent to his own people and he's able uh, to bring healing where he couldn't before. The son of God, Jesus, couldn't. Son of man, son of God. He couldn't heal because healing is not done in the mind. Healing is not done with an expansive time. Healing is only done, according to Luke chapter 4, by the Spirit of God. That's it. The healing that you and I are looking for concerning a crushed spirit, a crushed heart, a crushed, it it only can be done by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God, you know what His role is? His only role as as a comforter is only to bring God's Word to you. Why is my soul tormented? Because it's holding the wrong words. I've been deceived into thinking that God's not for me. I've been deceived into thinking that God is against me. This is the same way that my soul is tormented towards my children or towards my friends. I've received the wrong word. 
but God heals broken heart. Do you think David, David, David had his son try to take his throne from him and kill him? David had, he was rejected by his father, put out into the field. Hey, his father said, this man, this man, his brother's his, you think David understood something about a broken soul? His wife, uh, Michael, when he was dancing before the Lord, she belittled him. And You think he understood a little bit about a, what, what did he have to get? He had to hear from his shepherd. He had to hear from the, from the Lord. And this is what, what he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel, to set the captive free. He tells us this, and then in John chapter 14 and John chapter 16, he tells us that the Holy Spirit's job. Jesus says, it's better I go away because I'm going to send you this helper, a comforter, and he's going to remind you, John 16, 13. Put it up there. John 16, 13. He tells us that, that he's going to bring to our remembrance everything that the Lord has said. He's going he's to be our comforter by the Holy Spirit. So, here's what I said, seen in my heart this morning. It's not so much a tingle or a feel, it's an opening up. When the, the Holy Spirit, uh, the Spirit of truth comes, this is what he is. Why is your soul tormented? Lies. There might be something that's true, but when the Spirit of truth comes, what you'll find is there's Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23 that begins to grow in your heart. Love and joy and peace and gentleness and all these things come about but he he will he will guide you in all truth he will not speak on his own but what will he do he will speak only what he hears and he will show you and tell you what's to come you know what is to come i know the thoughts and plans i have for you declares the lord thoughts of hope and thoughts of a future and i know what what that's talking about so don't uh, in, in Je uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, he's talking about the children of Israel. I get that. But he, let me tell you, he's prophesying to you and me that there's a future of hope. He's going to show you what's to come. He's going to show you that he's there to help. He's going to show you, this is what you and I need today, is, Lord, I'm asking you, because this healing of the soul is not natural, it's spiritual. I'm asking you for your words concerning my body. I'm asking you for your words concerning my relationship. I'm asking you your words concerning the church I'm supposed to be at. I'm asking you for your words concerning whatever it might be. Make it clear to me so that I don't make a move off of a different word. Let's stand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So uh, that's that's what I want to do this morning. I want to just uh, us to lift our, uh, just to close our eyes. In any place that you have hurt, any place that your soul and your mind has been tormented, we're going to ask the Lord. We're going to ask the Lord for His Word, His the truth, His Word on any situation. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. He'll show you things to come. And there'll just be an exchange. I just, uh, that's what I, in my heart, we're going to just make an exchange of my thoughts, uh, what's been holding me for his words. It's just going to be uh, by his spirit. Not by might, not by power. I've been trying, I've been trying, but by his spirit. So, Father, right now, we just close our eyes. We lift our hands to you. You said you are near the brokenhearted. You are the healer. You are the restorer. You bring back again. And so we're asking you right now for truth. For the truth of your word, of your promise, of your plan. Where hope's been lost, we're asking you for your word again. We release hurt, blame, we refuse to be a victim because you are our restorer. So Father, thank you for your word concerning our father, concerning our mother, concerning our our son and our daughter. 
Thank you for your word concerning our bodies, concerning healing. Thank you for your word concerning relationships and provision. Today we, we steer our lives with the words of our mouth and we simply say, Lord, we trust you. Lord, we trust you. We trust you. You're a restorer. You can make dead bones live. And so we speak to places that are dead. Then we say live again. We speak to relationships that are lost and, and seem to, we say be found and restored and brought back. We speak to joy that hey, we say be found. Flourish. Be fruitful. We speak to wombs this morning and we say come alive in the name of Jesus. Thank you for restoring my soul. Father, we say thank you for restoring my soul. Thank you for restoring my soul. Thank you for making me whole. Just say that. Thank you for making me whole. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I had seen that in my heart concerning um, uh, a young a young man and a young woman, a relationship that um, he had, you'd lost, a, a, in a sense, you felt like you lost a relationship and part of you is just, had been lost with that. And uh, the Lord's making you whole. And this is one that we're going to declare Jesus this morning as we receive communion and close. Um, this has been something I've been wanting to do every week. Uh, as we declare Jesus, a, a payment for us, a promise for us. Go ahead and pass that out. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Ev, will you come? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
So we just receive by faith wholeness this morning. We receive wholeness. And this is what receiving communion is about. It's about declaring Jesus as payment for sin. Death entered from sin. Separation, that's what death is. Division. And so this morning, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to declare you as our deliverer, our freedom from every effect of sin, every effect of separation, every effect of death in our lives. Today we declare the life of God in this house, the life of God in our bodies, the life, your life for our life. Thank you, Father. The Bible says on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. He said, take and eat this in remembrance of me, your body for us. Father, thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Your body for us. And he took a cup and he said, this is a New Testament, a new agreement that I'm making with my blood. Thank you, Father. Your blood as payment for our sins. We receive it now in Jesus' name. So any place that death has been, we just declare right now, it is unlawful. It is unlawful to be in our lives. It's unlawful. It's against the law because payment was made in Christ. Payment was made in Christ. And we made a declaration today. We, made, we declared before you, Lord, and we declared before all the powers of the air that Jesus paid the price for our sins. So death, you have no place, no reign in our house, in our children, in our homes, in this church. We thank you for life, life, and more life. You are the good shepherd. We thank you for leading us out. We thank you for being a protector. We thank you for being a restorer. We thank you and we do declare that goodness, surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. So we set a hope. We ho open our hearts to expect Surely, 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 surely goodness and mercy. Surely goodness and mercy. Oh, good things in store for me. Good things in store for my children. Good things in store. There's good things in store. Father, thank you. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me, shall chase me down all the days of my life. Looking for me. Your goodness and your mercy, it's looking for me every day of my life every day of our lives. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. Well, God bless you guys. Uh, you guys are dismissed, and we will see you Wednesday night.